All right, appreciate that, Pete. Glad to be here with everybody today. I'm Dr. John Tomacek, Extension Wildlife Specialist out of San Angelo, and this is a great opportunity to be here with my friend Dr. Morgan Russell and Mr. Brian Treadwell to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it, you know, co-managing grazing lands in Texas for, for both hunting, wildlife, and for grazing operations is kind of part and parcel of the business now in many places. Uh, and certainly for me, growing up, I grew up on a beef cattle operation, and uh, much to my daddy's chagrin, did not end up being a, a beef cattle scientist or a range scientist, but ended up being a wildlife man. But today what we're going to talk about really is, is how those two work together pretty well, how we can, can help them work together even better, and how to make those rangelands in Texas uh, a great place for both wildlife and grazing animals. So that being said, I always start out uh, by asking everybody the question. Of course, you can see the slide in front of you pretty clearly. I say, do deer avoid cattle? People, I, I always ask that. I said, do the, the deer avoid cattle? Is that a thing? You know, and they say, well, John, you the picture in front of us. You know, we see deer and cattle together at the same pasture on the same slide. But you'd be uh, surprised how often we get that question. So that, that's what I'm going to put to you and think about it as we go along today. At the end of the presentation, I suspect you'll, you'll be able to answer it. But as we get started, uh, as you'll see Pete putting in front of you that, that polling question, uh, that, that's when I want to see what the audience thinks here. And it's, it's great to have this in a webinar, because uh, in person I always ask a show of hands or a secret ballot, uh, and, and it's, there's no wrong answer here. It's just uh, interesting what people say, and there's situations where it may or may not be true, and, and we're going to talk about those. That in wildlife, there's never one hard and fast right or wrong answer. It's always it depends. So we're going to talk about what it depends on today. And uh, we'll wait a second for those to come in. Pete, I don't know uh, how long you need me to wait on that poll as people chime in. Okay, there we go. So it's off the screen. I'm going to move on. I want you all to keep that question in mind. So when we talk about integrating wildlife and livestock, a lot of folks imagine the picture in front of you. They imagine a, a tug of war, a contest. Wildlife needs some things and livestock need others. And by golly, you know, that's, that's what it has to be. You have to give some or get some. And I, I want to encourage you not to think about it that way, but I want you to encourage it, uh, you think about it rather as a balancing act. So the rangeland only produces so many resources, how we, we set those out is a balancing act between wildlife and livestock to keep our rangelands healthy. Uh, I, I'm a systems approach kind of guy. I don't believe in, in just livestock management or just wildlife. I believe in land management and good sound rangeland stewardship. So. I'm going to talk about it a lot, but I want you to think of it as a balancing act. That balancing act's got some moving parts in it. First thing we've got to figure out is, is what's our goal with our piece of property, either that we own or that we manage. Where do we want it to be? I may have some livestock goals. Uh, maybe it's for profit. Maybe traditional management, uh, like I grew up in a, in a cow-calf operation, and we're trying to turn a profit, put food on the table. For a lot of folks anymore, it, it may end up being a hobby. You know, perhaps you own the ranch and you live in town or work in town and, and uh, ranching's your, your true passion so you use your town job to support your habit as my daddy used to say. And the folks nowadays too it may be aesthetics. Uh, they may like seeing those animals out there. A wonderful situation we had a man move from North Carolina to the rolling plains of Texas and he moved in and the neighbors were all worried what was going to happen and, and nothing changed. He continued to run cattle and I said you know what's your goal here and he said oh I don't really need to make money per se. I, I just think in Texas, when you have a ranch, you ought to have some cows. That's what you do. So it may be aesthetics. On the wildlife side of things, we've got a few other things we think about. It may be I, I like to manage for hunting, whether that's uh, you know me and my family getting out there and hunting, uh, kids, grandkids. We just like to manage for that hunting opportunity, those game animals. It may be lease income. Um, wildlife leases, whether that's for hunting or for wildlife watching, in a number of areas have become increasingly important to help the ranch stay profitable overall, and uh, certainly an, a source of supplemental income in drought years when we have to reduce grazing pressure. For some folks, again, it, it's aesthetics. You know, they buy a piece of property, their piece of Texas, they like being out there and seeing all the, the birds and the critters, and it makes them feel good about it. Uh, and for a small set of our folks here in Texas, you know, their wildlife management goals may have to do with endangered species being on the property. Uh, maybe that's just part and parcel of what happens on your land. You're used to it and you've got to think about it when you manage. And that may also be, hey, we've got this endangered species and somebody's willing to pay us to, to manage them through a variety of tools. So we're going to do that. But whatever your goals are, we have to identify those first. And that's what I'm going to suggest you do. And so the next thing we always think about is, okay, I've got my goals for both wildlife and I've got my goals for livestock. 
Uh, and, and so what's that actual interaction going to be? There's a lot of myth and mystery out there, and to break it down be pretty simple about it, the actual overlap is, is pretty, pretty easy to line out. So you may have a diet overlap. It may be that there are two animals that compete with each other for a singular food resource. Can't make an infinite amount of it on rangelands, and so you've got to figure out how those two are going to compete. Now, the other competition may come in terms of what's being eaten out there on the landscape. Other than food, think about uh, bobwhite quail. Now, bobwhite's a great animal. Needs a number of things it can nest in, but in a lot of places, those, those warm season perennial bunch grasses like little blue stem are the gold standard for nesting habitat. They also make great food for some of our livestock animals, and so there can be a competition there between uh, habitat needs for a certain animal and those items being food for another. Yeah, and other times, just having uh, habitat features on the landscape, uh, such as adequate brush cover that may confer some amount of security, whether from heat or predators or you name it, uh, or just be habitat that an animal can move through from one pasture to another. And I always bring up the, the point of, if I have a piece of rangeland surrounded by thousands and thousands of acres of cotton fields, uh, it's unlikely that quail from anywhere else are going to travel across there and end up on my piece of rangeland and vice versa. So thinking about providing adequate uh, habitat while still providing those food resources for our livestock. But that's the actual overlap that we get into, just to be plain and simple about it. The other thing I like to bring up and to point out to people, I've got a, a set of slides in front of you. When we think about diet overlap, there's a certain amount of confusion that goes on, and, and this one has got on the far right-hand side of the screen the animals that typically eat grass or roughage, uh, and then on the far left-hand side, those that select for what we call concentrates, typically browse plants, uh, woody species that are high concentrations of various nutrients that are required. And you can see there's a whole variety of things on there, but let's see if my, my little dots will show up. There we go. So you see I circled cattle there, if you could see my, my blue circle. So we typically deal with cattle, sheep, Goats are traditional livestock animals in most of Texas. I won't get in too much to the exotics, but you know we think about those. And by adding whitetail deer to the landscape, well, that doesn't look too bad. You know, we we can work without too much diet overlap. Depending where you live in the state of Texas, we may encounter some others. What if you've got red deer? If you brought some exotics in, or fallow deer, or any number of the other exotics will fall in that category. Well, now you've got some overlap if you've got goats out there, maybe even sheep, and you, you may run into some difficulties. Throw some quail in the mix that need that, that grass, that food resource, as a place to live. Let's throw some turkeys in there, kind of in between, that need some forbs and some woody plants and various things. And let's throw rabbits in there. And people always say, John, why did you throw rabbits in? Nobody has a trophy rabbit lease in Texas. And I say, well, you know, for folks, especially in the sheep and goat industry, that, that fight issues with predation day in and day out, Adequate food in the form of rabbits and rats, things like that, uh, is really an important consideration for keeping predators on native foods. So there's a whole lot going on out there, and you're going, man, John, this is, this is not what we want to see. This is complicated. So how are we going to do this? And I tell people, life, just like land management, is compromise, compromise, compromise. So the first question, can you simultaneously maximize livestock production and wildlife? And, and what do I mean by maximize? I mean 100% of the productivity of that rangeland is going towards one item or the other. Hang on my, my slide. There we go. No, you can't do it. We don't have 200% or 10,000% of anything. We've only got 100% of that rangeland productivity. What we can do, however, can we optimize it? So make those two work together as seamlessly as possible and have benefits to one overlap benefits to the other? You bet we can. We have to make some concessions. We have to make some things happen for both of them. So the concessions we make. First off, we need a stocking rate conducive to our wildlife needs. Whatever that is in your part of the state, the livestock animals you run, we need something that's going to help those two work together. Uh, and then, like I say, that may depend. If you're running beef cattle in bobwhite country in South Texas, you need to not overgraze that pasture to such an extent that the quail will have place to nest. At the same time, if that's uh, you're managing uh, goats and white-tailed deer together as your primary goal, you need to be pretty, uh, pretty observant with your, your browse pressure on woody plants to make sure that there's enough food out there for both of them. And the thing that this all comes down to, I'll remind everybody of, if you haven't already engaged in some kind of rotational grazing system, and there's a number of them we'll talk about, I would encourage you to do that. 
The other thing is having a calendar of activities that's amenable to both the hunters out there on the, in the pasture and also the herd management you do. And, and this may seem kind of off the side, but I remind people all the time, you know, when I was a, a private land consultant, the thing we ran into more than anything else was uh, if we had hunters out there all year long and anything from deer to pigs to you name it, they would also uh, run into problems when the, the rancher needed to work animals, close gates up, move things around. Uh, they'd clash and they'd have arguments with one another. So working those two calendars together keeps in mind that you're trying to balance both those activities on your property, not have them be two separate operations. So I have a question for you and, and I want you to think about that. What is the greatest impact on forage abundance and availability in the pasture? Other than rainfall, of course, we all know if it doesn't rain, you can't grow any forage. Well, that one's pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. It's your grazing system and your stocking rate. Plain and simple, those are going to impact forage abundance and availability, whether you're trying to feed livestock with it or you're trying to make habitat for wildlife. So there's a number of different grazing systems out there, and I'm not going to get into the weeds too much with the time we've got today. Your local extension agent or your range specialist does an excellent job of, of walking you through these. There's any number, and I would advise you to, to think about what works for your property. There's a high-intensity, low-frequency, decision-deferred, the old traditional merrill grazing system with four pastures, three herds, rotate them every four months. Uh, just about anything other than most folks have moved away from a continuous grazing system in trying to manage for their wildlife and their livestock together. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but to make a long story short, by doing uh, rotational grazing, we can leave aside places at certain times of the year for wildlife and when we do want that, that grazing pressure in there to stimulate forage growth to maybe get a little hoof action on the soil, we can put those animals in there. Continuous, you end up with kind of a patchy landscape with some parts of it being used and others not. So we use a rotational grazing system of some kind and a stocking rate that makes sense for your country because that grazing intensity is going to be absolutely crucial. You may say, well, John, I had a rotational grazing system. Did exactly what you said. Uh, but I stocked animals in there about as thick as I could, made it look like a feedlot, turned that pasture into bare dirt and rocks. Well, that's not going to work very well for anything. So we want to make sure we're working with local stocking rates, adjusting to rainfall conditions. If we're in the drought of 11, it looks a whole lot different than today. So how, what are the strategies you can get at? And I, I like to remind people of this in terms of livestock management. You know, aside from traditional cow-calf operations, you could use stalkers, right? You got a lot of flexibility there in terms of being bring animals in and out. You have a relatively quick drought response in those situations. If you need to sell animals quickly, that's not saying anything about markets, but the ability to bring them in, bring them out. A lot of folks just don't feel as married to them as they do with with their traditional cow calf operations, you know, and, and managing those animals year to year for production. The other thing that I've seen people do, and I think it's interesting and would encourage you to give some thought to and talk to one of our economists or, or someone in your community, is a lease that's on a per head per month basis. Uh, and I've had a few people tell me they like this. Their point was that it's pretty easily adjustable. So your, your lessee only pays uh, for the animals that are actually running on that pasture. And they say they had better long-term relations with the lessee because in times of drought, uh, if it's poor times, you can both agree, well, we need to pull a few animals off, and okay, your price goes down, and it doesn't make them feel as obligated to, to try to grab every ounce of rangeland resource out of that pasture. Again, better in the long term for your grazing, better in the long term for your wildlife, so you have better potential impacts to the rangeland. But the thing that's crucial to think about in all of this, and we showed this photo on our front slide, is habitat diversity. Habitat for a whole lot of things, and you hear the word diversity a lot nowadays, it's pretty popular, but in this context, what do we mean? Well, that I can get my livestock or my wildlife's needs met by a variety of plants through the seasons, conditions, whether that's drought or heat, extreme cold, predation problems, that the plants out there in the pasture, that rangeland resource can provide everything they need. That pasture in front of you is off a place in Coleman County, Texas, very productive cow-calf operation. You see a little prickly pear out there, a little bit of mesquite, some other brush, but a diversity of forbs and grasses and the wildlife on this place, I will tell you, it's, it's like the quail are bubbling out of the ground and the deer are fat and happy and so are the cattle. Being able to have a variety of plants out there and avoid monocultures is what we want. So when we think about making room for wildlife on rangelands, the two photos in front of you are kind of the contrast. On the left, you'll see that coastal Bermuda pasture, big and thick and beautiful, 
And you may live in a part of the state where coastal Bermuda is popular and has been for a number of years as an improved grass. But at the same time, that monoculture is not good for wildlife. It's like a desert to many of our species that can't make a living off of it. On the right-hand side, that Coleman County rangeland, again, although productive for livestock, provides a lot of availability for wildlife as well. Pound per pound of forage may be different, but it's that optimization of those rangeland resources. The other thing we talk about is brush sculpting. So typical strategies out there in the pastures is going to be, you know, managing your, your woody plants and how you deal with that brush. Brush sculpting is a term that came about years ago, and, and I think it's a, a great way to look at your brush control in the pastures. So it basically means the planned selective removal of that brush to enhance wildlife habitat on rangelands. So we're going to do some brush management. It's important for wildlife and livestock. We want to do it in a way that helps us out reach our goals. So basically what we do, and I always tell people, much like the diversity slide, wildlife love a big mess. They don't like things neat and clean. They like it mixed up and messy. So these patches of brush that we leave, it varies depending on what you're trying to manage, but they're not often like the bottom right-hand corner, that big square. They're usually rough edges. We leave oblong, awkward shapes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it increases uh, surface area of that brush to grassland edge or open space edge. We also leave the species behind that are of most benefit to whatever wildlife we're trying to manage for, whether that's palatable brush for deer or whether that's uh, little clumps of brush for quail to hide under. So next time you do some brush management, think about an application that will allow you some flexibility in where and how you manage. And again, the considerations we typically make out there, just to be uh, topside about it, you know, what's your topography of your property look like? It's going to limit what you can do. Not everything may be appropriate. For wildlife, we think about thresholds, both of security from predators, do they have enough uh, brush cover to get under, and also from thermal cover. You know, in the summertime in Texas, it gets awful hot. Everything needs to find some shade. Have we left enough shade for those animals? And is the, the, browse control, or the brush control we're doing going to work with whatever grazing system we have? If I put a pasture mostly into brush that I need to open up some more country in, okay, that works. But what's my follow-up maintenance going to be? What's it going to cost me year to year to keep this up? And, and what are my target species for dealing with in this area? The other thing is, with overkill in a pasture, when you have wildlife species that, that desperately need some of those woody plants to survive, whether that's for habitat or food, uh, we can often get into a situation in today's world with chemical and mechanical brush control where it's easy to overkill, take a lot more away. You know, it's easy to gradually take stuff. It's a lot easier to, to do that than to put it back later and wait for it to regrow, particularly in our drier rangelands. So, when you talk about your grazing system selection, things I want you to remember is, is the timing of it, what seasons are you going to run, what pastures, what duration, and what area are you working in, in terms of what acres are actually grazable on your property. Uh, you know, there may be areas where livestock just don't go and don't use, and that may be better for wildlife. Again, we talked about stocking rates. What livestock species are you putting out there, and what does it actually eat compared to your wildlife? We talked about earlier. And uh, what do your wildlife need? I say life history. Basically, I mean, what do they need throughout the year? Uh, what are their needs in spring, summer, fall, winter? And what do those habitats look like? How can you provide them across your property? So what we need is broad interspersion, broad mixing up of these habitats over a big area, not just in one pasture. And, and what are those nutritional needs for your livestock, for your wildlife? What economic demands do you have? There's a whole lot that goes into this. That all may feel like an awful complex equation. And I put this up here because my best friend growing up ended up being a mathematician. I was never the greatest mathematician in the world, but boy was he. And I always say, you know what, that's great for him, but I need to break those things down into simpler terms I can understand. So for the wildlife we typically manage in Texas, I want to remind you about some habitat considerations real quick. Just brief top view. We could spend all day talking about this, but just to whet your appetite a little bit. With deer, when we think about their forage, there's a lot of seasonal variation in what they can use, and most of that has to do with what's growing out there. Oftentimes, rotational grazing or reserves on deer, depending on the livestock species you're running, will allow us to keep some forage out there in the pasture season to season. Now, again, between deer and cattle, there's not a whole lot of diet overlap at all. But they may compete, even with cattle, a little bit for those forbs, those weedy, broadleafed, herbaceous plants out there in the pasture. So what do uh, deer nutrients look like? Because deer need adequate nutrients. 
If you want to put big antlers on a deer, you just want them to be nice and healthy, what do they need? Well, to make a long story short, deer need water, proteins, carbs, fats, vitamins, and minerals. And you look at that and you go, great, that's the same thing everything needs, John. But in Texas, you know, we often focus on, on putting antlers on and healthy reproduction and things like that. So the question there is, and, and I think this is one of our clickable questions Pete's going to load up, how much crude protein do we need out there in the pasture just to make that room and function, at a minimum, to keep that deer surviving, to keep them out there, not necessarily putting on big antlers, not being in optimum condition, but just keeping the, the gut fauna, those little microbacteria running in the gut. How much do they need in their diet? Crude protein. And everybody's going, now I'm going to go check my feed tag on my protein feed. I know what you're doing. We'll give that just a second for folks to chime in before we move on. All right, looks like we've got a pretty strong consensus one way to six or seven percent. I like that. That looks pretty good to me. Let's let's click on forward, see what we're actually dealing with here. Hang on. There we go. So you're right, six to seven percent crude protein just to make that room and function. Now, when we get up and wanting to put on antlers and grow our bodies bigger, get reproduction successful, get those females in condition, we need about 13 to 16 percent crude protein in the pasture. Now, our rangeland plants can do everything we need. Of course, some folks supplementally feed, which is fine, but rangeland plants are capable of doing all that. A great example I like to point out is uh, mistletoe. Mistletoe is actually one of the highest crude protein plants in the pasture, somewhere up around 22 or 23 percent crude protein. So when we look at deer forage, just to make a general rule, there's a little bit of use of grass and grass-like plants, not a whole lot. Deer has a very short, very small uh, intestinal tracts, hard for them to extract nutrients from that like a cow can. Most of it's going to be with our broadleaf plants and our browse, our woody plants. That's where that di deer's diet's going to come from. Especially in the winter time, uh, most of that's going to be browse. We don't, we're not growing a lot else. So critical nutrition needs on the right kind of woody plants in the winter time. So to summarize, we want for habitat some small, usually about 20 acres at a time, irregularly shaped patches of brush throughout the landscape. Now, clearings in total in an ideal world for whitetail, I always say between 40 and 60 percent of open country, and the other 60 percent or 40 percent, depending on what works for your operation, should be in, in brushy country, right? But again, small patches, irregularly shaped, and we do want some stands in there where the, the brush is tall and dense to provide a good amount of, of shade in the, the summertime for the winter. And again, we, we want to avoid clearing out the brush necessarily in and along drainages because it may provide good cover for some of those animals. Uh, and if we've got those large single stem mesquites, we try to leave those in. Uh, but in general, we try to avoid planting introduced grasses that'll take over country, you know, like old world blue stem and buffalo grass. They can get some wildlife use, but they're not as good as our natives necessarily. So what I mean by those irregularly shaped patches, I, I like to put this in front of you, and I, I stole this slide from my predecessor. It's been around a long time. Uh, but with these patches, if the light areas you see shaded are where we remove brush, then what we leave behind is actually an irregularly shaped patch, has a lot of surface area because deer love that, that uh, brush cover to, to open country uh, edge. So we maximize for edge. And people always say, John, this looks like you got a dozer operator and he had a couple of Budweiser's before he got going. I'm not advocating ever running heavy equipment intoxicated, but sure, uh, they're not clean lines. So, for water, you know, it's, it's pretty easy. We just want to make sure we've got equal water distributed across that country. Earthen tanks, low troughs, whatever you got. Guzzlers are fine. Uh, and sometimes we fence off wildlife and intensive grazing operations just to keep some cover around that water, but, but deer are pretty flexible. They're not going to be too picky about it. So what about turkeys? I'm going to touch just briefly on turkeys and others. So turkeys, they like those forebridge clearings. Uh, they need a lot of those weedy plants in their diet. In the summertime, uh, insects are key for hens and young. Uh, they need that very, very high protein that they can get from an insect-heavy diet. Uh, and water, turkeys are interesting with water. Now, you'll see them everywhere, uh, but some folks choose to separate turkey water sources from livestock. That may be by putting out a guzzler and fencing it off or having an area on a tank that's, that's got some portable panel fencing off that allow the turkeys in. Uh, 
Some folks uh, just have old rock cisterns they allow to the water to get to the top and turkeys sit on the edge and drink. It's usually fine. Turkeys are a funny bird, though, and sometimes they get weird about livestock at water with them. The thing I will say, though, turkeys is, is cover. They like some open woodland areas, and in the spring for their nesting cover, ideally we want that dirt, the grass and weeds to be between 18 inches to 2 feet tall, and the similar thing for, for fawn cover for deer. Uh, in a lot of ways, you know, that may be tough for folks with their grazing management, but I always say if you've got some areas you can set aside, that's ideal. Now, roosting cover is usually the thing we get into most with turkey habitat that's tough. Uh, turkeys need good quality roost trees. These are large, mature trees. Uh, a lot of times think of oaks, pecans, even some hackberries, things of that nature, but big, strong, mature, closed canopy trees, and we try to minimize brush underneath them and out to about 100 yards from them. These turkeys are an awkward flying bird and they need a runway to get up and down. And in the brush underneath the tree, oftentimes we'll get into a situation where predators can sneak up uh, on the tree at night and kill turkeys on the roost if the brush is too thick for the birds to see them coming. And again, that broodering habitat, forward bridge, herbaceous, foot to two feet tall, and most of that's just to provide screening from predators and for, for thermal cover. Now here's the thing, when we want to make turkey habitat, I tell people, protect your mature trees, especially in creek bottoms and lowlands, because those are going to be turkey super highways on and off your property, and especially back to about three quarters of a mile away from those riparian areas is going to be some of your best quality turkey habitat, just in terms of providing access. Your brush control, be good, but be careful, especially under those roost trees. And fire in the right interval is, is great for turkeys in terms of creating some disturbance, so you know, providing some prescribed fire in there. In some situations, people have said, hey, we've got to control deer abundance because they overlap for forbs. And I don't know that that's always true. I've always seen them work pretty well together, but uh, if you see a problem with that, you could uh, reduce your deer numbers a little bit. And then grazing management, highs and lows, you know, those, those four bridge, those weedy areas, turkeys like some, some pretty heavy grazing at times that increases the amount of forbs that come up, creates some disturbance. Any kind of disturbance you can make is good. So again, ideas for, for turkey cover, you know, some of that, those tall trees you can see in the background there, never bad. As far as making quail habitat, you know, forage for quail is pretty seed heavy on those forbs and grasses. So they need those small seeds to, to eat and forage. And a lot of times, bare ground, while they like the, the native grasses, bare ground between 30 and 60% is typically ideal for them. We don't want big patches of bare ground, especially not towards the 60% line, uh, but in between clumps of grass and things of that nature. Uh, insects, just like turkeys, are essential to have. So some of those little bit overgrazed areas you have where they're very heavy in insects in the springtime may be good for those hens and chicks to find some resources. Cover, though, for turkeys, a little bit different. Roosting cover at night, again, think about places on your, your operation that have been a little bit less productive, a little bit overgrazed. That roosting cover may be between four and six inches tall. They like that. They can group up at night and, and see around them. Uh, but that nesting height really is critical that it's uh, between 12 and 18 inches high uh, with nine plus inches in diameter at its base. And again, those warm season perennial bunch grasses are, are really the ideal gold standard to create some good quality nesting substrates in. In an ideal world, I'd have 400 of those per acre to provide adequate nesting cover and also keep Wiley Coyote from being able to single out the place that mama quail has laid a nest. And as far as escape cover goes, we like low shrubs, about three yards wide, and we like them no taller than five foot so that a hawk won't roost on them and spread out throughout the landscape. So again, this comes back to your brush control, targeting what you leave and where not just coming through a pasture and, and killing every single brush plant out. But typically we don't want them more than about 30 or 40 yards apart uh, just because a Bob White's not going to find their way to it before they get hit by an avian predator. You get much past that. And what about water? Well, quail don't necessarily need free water. You can provide it, but they get most of what they need from their diet. And so techniques there, brush control, but again, brush sculpting. Fire is excellent in terms of prescribed fire for quail. Uh, they are a grassland bird, and the grassland regeneration we get off fire is very beneficial for them. Sound grazing management, though. We don't want to overgraze areas, and we certainly don't want to uh, hit preferred species the quail actually nest in that are also highly preferred for cattle and run those species out with time. Predator control may be useful in, in your operation if you've got nest predators, raccoons, skunks, foxes, things of that nature, hitting them hard. 
Um, but again, we want to create messy, broadly interspersed landscapes kind of like this one. This is not in the middle of growing season. I know it looks kind of dry. Uh, but again, low brush cover around. There's still adequate grasses out there in the middle. Plenty of places for quail. And again, those nesting plants, we want thickness like on the bottom right. Uh, we want nice, healthy looking grasses like on the left. All right, I think I'm just about out of time. Uh, Dr. Russell, would you like to introduce Mr. Treadwell? Yes, sir. It would be my pleasure. Um, Mr. Treadwell graduated from SMU in 1992. He was hired right out of school to hunt and host for one of the largest hunting video producers in the world. He says that hunting all over the U.S. showed him how special his place was in Texas. And Mr. Treadwell then started Rocket Tea Outfitters in 1994. At the peak of Rocket Tea Outfitters, he leased and hunted about 70,000 acres. He ended up hosting a hunting and conservation show on Outdoor Channel from 1998 to 2000. And then he later went on to win the Aldo Leopold Award and Lone Star Land Steward Award in 2006. All in all, he is a hunter, a commercial prescribed burn manager, a rancher, stock farmer, land consultant, and land broker. Welcome, Mr. Treadwell, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me on, and I, I'd like to say from the very start that uh, I do agree with everything Dr. Tomachek said. Um, I would like to say that from all of all of my information is uh, I guess it would be classified as more anecdotal than scientific and uh, uh, I believe though that we can maximize livestock and wildlife and I'm here to say that you can do it if you change your focus from say weaning weights and antler inches to the big picture of habitat stewardship uh, if we focus on managing the habitat and for managing for grass residue uh, in a sense in essentially managing a property for prescribed fire uh, we begin to maximize nature and um, prescribed fire is uh, one of the main tools that we used on our ranch to uh, uh, get the attention for the what turned into this Lone Star Land Steward Award and uh, Aldo Leopold Conservation Award. Uh, I think we were it was in 2006 and we were we were early in the curve of of doing a lot of burning and using it as a as a tool to repair habitat and to um, you know attract wildlife and and to feed our cattle. Uh, I heard on a radio report yesterday. Uh, on rural radio about uh, a K-State study in the Flint Hills on stalkers and they were saying that those cattle that's a 90-day grazing window up there and the calves come in and the ones that go into the burned pasture come out an average of 55 pounds heavier than the ones that graze unburned pastures and so ranchers in the Flint Hills are beginning to get a premium for their for their grazing lease because they do burn and I'm sure it's got beneficial results for all of the wildlife up there. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Russell, you might need to get a little closer to the microphone. Is that better? Yes, sir. Good. So uh, I was saying how, how, how fire has, has had a big impact and it's having a more recognized impact in agriculture and in, in my commercial burn business where we go and we burn for landowners uh, say burns we did this summer and and come back for additional burns on the same property you know sometimes we'll burn four or five thousand acres on a place and uh, do it over a couple of weeks when we come back the deer we see are totally covered in ash and they roll in it and I guess do all sorts of unnatural frolicking and I think that that's a an idea for us to see how how nature um, works together because if we add fire at different times and different seasons you know where maybe when conventionally we haven't before I think that we can use it as a real draw for our hunting season um, and so we begin to balance uh, nature and and the uh, and the livestock business um, you know to to maximize for us you know with a high intensity 
uh, low frequency rotation uh, it has a lot to do with the grass height and you know when we're concentrating on the grass and looking at grass and trying to evaluate it what we're really looking at is our range health and you know that's what we don't see but what we see of the grass on top of the ground correlates directly to how much root it has below the ground and and you know that's how we know if if we're doing a good job of of taking care of the property that all these factors come together um, i think that uh, uh for us um, you know converting pasture that was covered in lots of prickly pear and 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 various invasive brush um, we could treat big blocks of it you know section two section pastures and bigger in a day and and be done with it and all the the healing starts over and 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 you know that process continues and and i suggest that if if we do more uh exploration with with the timing of our fires uh we'll have not only different results in diversity but we'll also have uh, a, a a bigger impact on moving wildlife and livestock. Uh, our our grazing used behind a fire. Um, we we would use a, a holistic resource management 12 month calendar, and we put all of our pastures on it, and we do calculate our grazing days and you know, for each pasture and, and take into consideration, you know, that how much, what percent of that pasture is covered in brush and take that out of the potential grass. And then, and then we'd have an idea of grazing days. And so uh, if it was uh, two weeks for 300 cows in a 500 acre pasture and, and we got a big rain or a beneficial rain on day eight or 10, a lot of times, we would go ahead and rotate to the next pasture and know that we were going to regrow some of that grass to have additional uh, fires that we could have uh, if timing and weather allowed. Um, the uh, uh, We always would plan to defer for one pasture for a burn and we would also um, adjust our stocking rate where this was a little over 8,000 acre ranch where we won the award you know we stocked it like it was 7,400 acres or so because we were always leaving a pasture out that was going to be totally deferred and and in our commercial burn business we see it where you know the concept is now you know if you're going to have a fire uh, if we can dedicate all of the grass that, that we were lucky enough to grow in that season towards brush control and using a match to ignite it and, and then know that we can come right in with our livestock and finish what prickly pear wasn't, wasn't burned off or, or, and then move out and then come back in uh, after beneficial rains have returned and, and, and we have enough grass residue to withstand the grazing uh, that we're feeding a higher protein feed and, and we can get away from more of the inputs that are required. Uh, we would do a, a, a rotation where, you know, not, not like an Alan Savory wheel, but we just looked at where our waters were and we expanded waters. We we're trying to have waters about every 300 acres, like Dr. Tomachek was, was implying that, you know, we need to expand the water to expand the wildlife resource and then that expands our grazing so we have more responsibility to monitor uh, more of these areas that we're getting animals to go into and and if we continue to look at it from a standpoint where um, we're trying to have a fire that will uh, limit brush encroachment that will stop prickly pear and, and, and kind of return us to a prairie, you know, as often as a fire frequency we could, we could fit in for that year's rainfall, um, you know, that to me is when you're really beginning to get a, a good connection with the ball and um, seeing the results that happen. You know, it, it uh, we would look at having, uh, 
uh, Dr. Russell, you're coming in a little, uh, little slow. Can you speak up a little louder? You kind of audio kind of fading out. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. And so, uh, what what we look for is uh, uh, trying to get through the rotation and have pastures to burn, have pastures we can come back to, and and expand our fire program uh, each year. Um, so that we're not burning the same pasture at the same time. Uh, and we found that, you know, when we would burn, even, even into October, uh, we would have a, a big return of deer and we'd almost, we'd almost feel like we had to put hunters in the, in that area to defend it from all of the animals trying to feed in it. So it, it's a neat tool to add into it. When you're beginning to look at, at the grazing picture, um, and the wildlife picture and, and kind of move your focus to stewardship for the habitat that we have in front of us. If you can get all those things firing, then your wildlife are better. You know, all these things are make it more beneficial and it, it's more of a sustainable agriculture practice for us all together. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Any questions for Mr. Treadwell, feel free to just go ahead and, and type it in the chat box, but we'll continue moving right along. Um, again, my name is Morgan Russell. I'm the Extension Range Specialist, um, actually right across the hallway from Dr. Tomachek. So him and I tend to be partners in crime. This is the first webinar that we have given together though, um, but I'm having a lot of fun and, and hopefully everybody else is too. Uh, moving on with the presentation. Let's talk a little bit about um, grazing distribution. And this is a slide borrowed from Dr. Bob Lyons. He's our range extension specialist and associate department head in Uvalde. And this is showing a Comal County ranch and the associated grazing cattle distribution with estimated area used and effective stocking rate. Now, I want you to pay attention to each green dot because that represents a GPS position of a cow wearing a GPS collar. And these GPS locations can be taken every, fit, every five minutes or every 10 minutes, depending on what the setup was. Um, so this is a great example that shows that based on the total acres that you have, you could set a stocking rate at 21 acres per cow. But based off of the GPS collars and what we see by those green dots, we see that grazing cattle have only really used 39% of the total pasture. So as a result, based on those grazable acres available, the effect of stocking rate that takes into consideration areas that cattle will not utilize is essentially nine acres per cow. And we've got a, a question coming up um, and we'll save that uh, Mr. Chisholm and, until uh, I'm, I'm done with these slides and then I'll hand them over to Mr. Treadwell and maybe he can answer that question or, or Dr. Tomacek. Uh, so in summary, regardless of your type of operation, and, and I get to do this summary slide because I feel like range management um, is at the, at the very foundation of wildlife habitat management um, and also grazing management. That, that lays the, the bricks ahead for the paved road that you're going to experience. So regardless of your type of operation, it's important to make room for wildlife. And from my experience in Texas, when your wildlife are doing well, everything else seems to be doing well, um, everything else seems to be in place as well. And what I really like about ideal grazing management um, and overall range management using mechanical, chemical, or even fire, is we can really start to lower those inputs and costs uh, to meet those overall goals and objectives. So we can break those, that summary down into pretty distinct categories of spatial and dietary importance. Spatial consists of habitat arrangement and structure. Of course, depending on those target species, we know that there's a lot of overlap there. And what we try to do is maximize that overlap. But we also know that certain species will have certain requirements as well. And especially as it relates to dietary requirements, we want to make sure those requirements are high in quality, that they're number one, available, uh, that diverse uh, 
requirements or diverse dietary exist and that also uh, plant species are abundant. So basically we aim for conditions similar to a buffet in Las Vegas. I don't know if any of y'all have ever experienced that but there's a little bit of everything to choose from. So how do we how do we get there? Um, we've heard Mr. Treadwell's philosophy, and we've heard what works for him when he's ranching in Menard, Schlacker, and Tongring counties. But as we all know, there are numerous options and strategies that can be considered outside the box. Um, but these strategies are also deeply rooted into uh, traditional rangeland management. However, we can always combine that traditional management with a few new twists. Um, again, in my experience in Texas, brush management is key. If you're not managing your brush, you're going to get so far behind that your management is going to have to start to become more of a reclamation management than that maintenance type of management that we like to see on our, on our pastures. But how you accomplish that management is entirely up to you. Mechanical, chemical, fire, and grazing are very strong strategies to build a solid foundation on. More recently, patch burn grazing is attracting a lot of attention because it provides increased amounts of plant diversity with varying habitat types created by the fire. Dr. Tomacek mentioned messy wildlife like messy environments and what's messier than a prescribed burn or even a wildfire that has come through on your on your operation when that wildfire hits a lot of people choose to think on about the negative side associated with it but in my experience and in my opinion um, a wildfire has just uh, really accomplished a lot of the work for you um, and has hopefully done a lot of good on that place so most importantly, be willing to try new management strategies to achieve different results and find what works best for you. I recently uh, spoke with a rancher just outside, well he ranches between Mertzen and San Angelo, and he was so against fire, but then his neighbor uh, did a little small prescribed burn that the NRCS conducted for him and when he saw the effects, when he saw how easy it was for his neighbor to do, he became on board with the power of prescribed burning and he realized that, um, that not all fires are created equal. So how do you determine which management strategy is, is going to work for you and how are you going to determine if it achieves your habitat and forage goals? The only way to do that, folks, is through monitoring. And um, here recently, uh, I presented a, a talk at the Beef Cattle Short Course, and we did an entire presentation on monitoring and how not only important is it, but how easy it can be as well. And this is really the only way to understand if your management is aligning with your goals, whether they're oriented toward wildlife or more oriented toward a livestock operation. Forage monitoring is a must regardless of that type of operation. So measuring diversity, standing crop, stubble height, and others is key. And there are really easy ways to go about this. For example, for you folks that are really in tune with technology, you have an iPhone and, or you have an Android, their uh, photo points can actually be accomplished by using an app called Grass Snap, and that logs your photo points which show the condition of the pasture, the type and relative abundance of species, ground cover and standing forage, evidence of erosion, effects of fire, effects of a late freeze, drought, or any other disturbances, and also recovery of problem areas. And these photo points are logged in this app that's on your phone. Um, and I don't even think you need a, a good cell phone signal um, um, to be able to, to input and insert those photos into that Grass Snap app. Um, if you have any more questions about any other apps that exist out there for monitoring, um, please feel free to email me or, or type in a question on the chat box and I'll be sure and cover more of those apps that can help you manage your monitoring. 
Monitoring also extends uh, well beyond plant monitoring, and I'm sure Dr. Tomacek or Mr. Treadwell can answer more of these questions, but wildlife surveys are extremely important just to get an idea of what population densities exist. A lot of times we focus on stocking rates for grazing livestock, but believe it or not, those wildlife populations also feed into your stocking rates as well. So it's a good idea to conduct deer surveys in late summer to have an idea of what type of densities exist going into hunting season during the fall. And keeping track of these counts uh, will also guide you to the management decisions that you'll need to implement to achieve your range and grazing management goals. Dr. Tomachek, I think you're up next to talk more about hunting. You bet. I appreciate that, Dr. Russell and, and Mr. Treadwell, as always. It's it's a pleasure to listen to, to Mr. Treadwell talk about his experiences as a rancher, and I, I couldn't agree more with everything he says. You know, it's we really do manage for the system. We manage for, for healthy rangelands and, and getting nature to, to do what it needs to do. You know, and in terms of our hunting management, I always like to bring up here at the end uh, a quote, and this is a fun one, so... You bear with me, my mother's been a Texas history teacher for the last 35 years, and there's a quote from a Spanish expedition that came across Texas, central-ish part of the state, and uh, if you ever served in the armed forces, uh, you know the enlisted men don't get near the nice treatment that the officers do, and so this was actually an enlisted man riding, uh, which is rare in, in the, the settler exploration period for one of those folks to be able to read and write, but he complains the whole time across Texas. He complains and complains that they have to be content, no matter where they go, with a diet of antelope and prairie chicken and quail because, unfortunately, the officers are the only ones to get to eat deer because they're so rare. Because where they were, Texas was big open grasslands, and the deer densities weren't as high as they are now where we have uh, woody cover across most of the state. So it's always important to remember that what we do with our habitat will change what's out there. But in terms of hunting management, there's a few things we like to ask each other and, and ask ourselves, when do I need to hunt? For a lot of people, this is pretty easy to answer. They go, uh, John, I need to hunt now and next year and the year after. Well, true enough, but the monitoring that Dr. Russell talked about is essential for us to understand how we're doing. What does this year look like compared to next year, 10 years from now? Uh, I'm not going to remember exactly how good it was, although I'll know it was good this year. So that data helps us track where we are. And maybe we're in a downward spiral. Maybe we've had a few bad years on our wildlife, and that monitoring gives us the information we need to know when to maybe reduce our, our hunting effort, those warning signs. So then people go, okay, when should I not hunt? Well, that's everybody's choice for themselves. During the drought of 11 and a couple years after, folks said, you know, John, we, we had so few animals reproducing well that we really held off hunting. And quail's a great example. Folks uh, came in and, and they said, okay, in our bags this year when we went out and hunted, uh, we aged those birds out like you taught us to, and, and very few of them were young birds. Most of them were older adult birds, so we didn't have a lot of reproduction successful this year. So we held off and let that brood stock live until next year. So sometimes that preseason monitoring helps us understand where we are, and, and sometimes that's during the season as we're hunting and we're looking at what we're getting. We go, you know, maybe we need to slow down a little bit. Uh, just helping us out, and particularly in those droughty periods we deal with to, to help take the pressure off our, our wildlife resources. Managing lease hunters is always a, a tricky thing, and, and I'm not a lawyer by any measure, and uh, I, I will avoid any legal questions. I will say uh, Tiffany Lashmitt, our, our law specialist with Extension, is wonderful, and she's got some recommendations for leases, uh, lease hunters, and even has an example, I believe, uh, but it's important to remember in those lease considerations, if you want to closely manage your hunting and be able to, to designate how many hunters are actually out there, not just how many folks on the lease, but what's the total number of hunters and how many days they're going to be out there, how many animals they're going to take. Give yourself some flexibility to adjust, just like you would stocking rates, adjust hunting pressure uh, with regard to what the conditions are like. Now, how you do that and keep your hunters happy is up to you, and I would advise flexibility on both sides, but it's important to be able to flex with those wildlife populations. And then people ask me, they say, you know, what about feeding? Um, what Should I feed? Should I not feed? And, and what I typical t typically tell people is that's your choice. Generally speaking, you're not going to do too much damage by feeding, uh, but you're not going to carry a population on bad habitat with just supplemental feed alone. Again, the word supplemental is key. It's a supplement to good, healthy rangelands. 
The other thing about feeding I like to bring up, I like to make you smile a little bit too, and is top left photo, you can see we've got a feral hog with a raccoon on top of it. You can just barely see the crank to that feeder there, right? So the story that goes along with this is sometimes they pair up and that raccoon stands atop the pig and just barely hits the spinner on that feeder. Drops some corn, they both have a good meal. So in, in some ways we attract some nuisance animals when we feed. On the bottom right is a photo from a place I used to manage. Uh, we had a kind of, you think, old water tower style feeder. So it's a wooden frame. On top of it is a 55-gallon drum with the spinner on it. And you can see my exclusion fence to keep pigs out of there in the foreground. But that buck got pretty wise. He figured out if he'd headbutt the feeder that more corn would drop. So he got habituated to it. So it did help concentrate those animals for our hunters to enjoy, so good and bad. Uh, but the thing to remember is there's no such thing as habitat in a bag. You got to have healthy rangelands like uh, like Mr. Treadwell talked about, like Dr. Russell talked about, in order to provide for all of those animals. And the other thing I like to harp on just a little bit because it's an issue that's clear and present and getting worse all the time is the feral hog or the wild pig or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I do tell people in balancing wildlife and livestock, these animals are wildlife and agricultural terrorists number one. Uh, they make that integration, that optimization much more difficult than it needs to be because they do pretty strongly compete with native wildlife, with livestock, uh, as well as being an issue for a number of disease items. I could talk about them all day, but the point is that they're taking money out of your pockets, they're hurting your livestock, hurting your native wildlife, destroying your piece of Texas, and if there were a human doing this, we would call him a terrorist and we would go round up everybody we could get and go deal with them. And the terrorist organization of the feral hog in, in Texas uh, is much larger and much more numerous than you'd imagine. Estimates now are starting to think that there are more pigs than white-tailed deer in the state. So my encouragement is anytime you can control pigs, trap them, shoot them, do whatever you need to do, removing that source of problem from the landscape is going to help better integrate wildlife and livestock. And I forgot to mention earlier, and I really should, when we think about integrating those two things, wildlife, livestock, one of the reasons that beef cattle are especially easy to integrate on healthy rangelands is we used to have a wild animal all across Texas that's a bovine whose diet's pretty similar to a beef cow, and that's the American bison, the buffalo. So the, the impact of a large herbivore on the landscape like that health system's built for it, and so we need that. It's important, it's essential, uh, but again, helping to balance those things, hard to control pigs. So. The thing I think we're going to wind down today and leave you with is, is that we live in a place that sometimes gets awful dry. I don't care where in the state you live, we face drought, and we try to manage our livestock relative to the droughts, take care of our rangelands, survive them, move on, and, and hopefully prosper later. And we also think about our wildlife that have to live out there on the rangelands. Right now, I, I took this photo the other day or took this image. This is the current drought map as of, uh, I think, a week ago. Most of the state's doing pretty well. There's some dry areas creeping up on us again. But I'd like to look back. When we're in a good year like this, it's easy to be a wildlife biologist. And everybody's got a big smile on their face and they're patting me on the back because it's a good year. At the same time, oh, so my other photo did not integrate. Okay, so it's supposed to do a transition. That photo's supposed to disappear uh, and show you what it was this time of year in 2011. And most of the state is just dark red. I mean, it was a bad time. So we're doing well now. But in my opinion, managing rangelands for wildlife, livestock, either way, uh, it's always waiting for the next drought and keeping those rangelands healthy to carry our animal resources through to the next good period. So kind of bringing it down, can I manage for livestock production and still have healthy wildlife populations? You bet you can. Uh, you know, Texas and some of the reason early settlers came here, it seemed like you couldn't use up the wildlife. They just keep on coming and you couldn't graze it hard enough because it was just so productive. And although in the modern era we know that's not true, the simple fact is, like Mr. Treadwell talked about, you can make your rangelands just produce bumper crops of, of these rangeland resources that are both these animals need. So again, you can absolutely do it. And back to the earlier question of did deer avoid cattle? Uh, no, no, they don't necessarily avoid them. They can work together uh, in, in some of those uh, intense rotational grazing systems. That's where I usually get the question. People will say, well, John, I never see the cows and the, and the deer together. They're always about two cells behind the cows is where the deer will be. 
Well, that intensive grazing is, has produced some disturbance. We've got some forb growth, some uh, weed plants, you know, uh, broadleaf herbaceous cover. Uh, and the deer getting in there and using that rangeland resource that that intensive grazing from the cattle has produced. So again, that, that healthy integration. So with that, I'm, I'm going to slow down and say thank you. I think we've got some questions, and I know uh, Dr. Russell and Mr. Treadwell will, will you know, get back on here and chime in. Uh, I'm going to look down here at the chat window because I'm bad about ignoring it. So uh, Mr. Chisholm asked, what's a typical income ratio of livestock versus hunting in Texas? Uh, Dr. Russell said, it's typical, typical's tough, cattle prices, so on and so forth. You betcha. So, so it is a tough one. Uh, and Mr. Chisholm, I appreciate that question. Dr. Russell's comment's very appropriate. It has a lot to do with the way prices are at a given time, but also the kind of country you're in. So uh, to put it to you this way, much of the hill country traditionally was, was pretty poor production for most livestock resources uh, from an economic standpoint compared to what you could get from hunting. And it's also a question of, of what period in time you're in. So uh, what's the typical ratio today? I've seen everything from people tell me they make almost nothing off the hunting to if they didn't have the hunting, their operation would go under. Uh, the truth is we don't have a good snapshot from a, a research standpoint of what that looks like across the state, uh, but it would be good to know. Uh, reality is for a lot of folks uh, nowadays, wildlife's an essential part of their operation, uh, and, and without it, life would be a lot harder. So I, I would love to know what typical is, but I think across the state, we've got a lot of variability, and markets definitely change that. You know, if tomorrow... Um, I don't know, I'm going to pick one out of the blue, and Treadwell's probably going to laugh at me. If Dorper sheep were the most valuable thing you could raise on rangelands, um, you bet. I, I think the income ratios would change with the market. As long as there's a healthy market on hunting in Texas, which I suspect there will be for a long time, I think we're going to continue to see its, its importance. Um, but it, do we have any other questions right now from folks that uh, myself, Dr. Russell, Mr. Treadwell could answer? As, as folks uh, sit here and, and uh, kind of type out the questions and, and give you all time to think and then type them out, let me say this. Uh, this uh, survey is going to pop up on your browser. Please take a few time to complete this survey. All responses are anonymous. And the information is used to improve our future webinars. And the next thing I'd like to say is our next session is going to be November 3rd. Do it yourself press control. Uh, Dr. Robert Lyons is going to be our speaker. And we'll we'll be uh, given one uh, uh, CU for IPM. And again, if you're not following us on Facebook, uh, you can follow us on facebookcom range. And we normally post uh, twice a week uh, some educational uh, session. So anyway, with that me saying that, uh, let me go ahead and post uh, the, the the web link for the layout. And it looks like y'all fixing to have another question. If by some chance uh, the the webinar, I mean the survey question covered up your your webinar, you look at the bottom and there's like a little green icon. You click on it, you can you can activate your webinar screen. And if you didn't get that, you can click on the link and it'll take you to the same place. And thank you all for attending today. Uh, I see one person typing. All right, I see a question about incorporating uh, protected species on a portion of your property and how you incorporate them into management. And, uh, you know, that, that's an interesting one. It's really going to depend what the protected species is and, and if you've got that on property from a, if it's federally protected, um, you know, that's, that's a different set of rules that you've got to follow. Um, hang on, I'm, uh, you're typing again. I'm going to let you go ahead and 
and finish that. It, really, it, it's going to come down to looking at the overarching regulations that you've got to got to work with, and uh, if it's federally protected, horned toads, indigos. Or, okay. Um, so at, at this point, you know, uh, these species are are state uh, listed for various things, but again, horned lizards. Um, to my knowledge, are not federally protected indigo snakes, that kind of thing. Uh, incorporating them into your management structure really just comes down to looking intensively at what those habitat needs are for those species and trying to make sure that they're out there across the state in a, in a broad perspective. Uh, and that's that's really going to be the key for it, just like any of our game animals. They're, they're a good example we talked about today, but the process is the same for whatever your goals are. I had a lady once that her, her number one species consideration on the property was painted bunnings. That was what she wanted, a small songbird, and, and she loved them. And so she built everything on her property around those. Uh, so again, if you're, if you're concerned about horned lizards or, or indigo snakes, that kind of thing, uh, checking on those habitat needs and trying to make sure those are provided across the property uh, and as much throughout the year as you can. D Dr. Tomachek, I'd like to add that... Uh... Uh, if if the property is in being managed to the best for nature, that all those animals and species are being taken care of, and that uh, where our ranch that we won the awards, we have black cap vireos, and basically that's like managing for white-tailed deer. Any any decision you make that helps helps that level of wildlife helps that level of songbird as well. Uh, you bet. Absolutely. Mr. Treadwell is quite right. I mean, it's it's healthy rangelands managing for nature. If they were supposed to be here to begin with, it's it's going to do good things. And if for some reason you get involved with like a, a federally protected, either threatened or endangered species on your property, an uh, important thing to remember is in today's world versus the early 90s, there are more options for landowners uh, that better recognize the fact that if they are still on your property, it's probably because you're a better steward of nature than others. Uh, and and give you some considerations for continuing to do what you already do. We've got a question about wheat field planning on wildlife and livestock. I'd venture to say, Dr. Tomachek, that it has no effect if it doesn't rain. <laughs> yeah, you betcha, you betcha. Uh, you know, wheat fields, uh, are you talking about as a supplemental feed source or... Okay, as a supplemental feed source, again, you know, I, I won't speak to the, the using it as forage for cattle and things like that. But as far as wildlife, uh, the important thing to bear in mind is if you're creating a large area of a wheat field, you know, several hundred acres or thousand acres or something like that, you're you're breaking up habitat and so maybe reducing connectivity a little bit. Uh, as a as a supplemental feed, it works fine. I would plant it more in long meandering strips on the property rather than in big blocks. You know, I'd, I'd keep it to a small number of acres in an area and, and kind of disperse it throughout the property. But but Treadwell's right. I mean, if it doesn't rain or if we're in a droughty part of the state, I'm not going to have a whole lot of impact. And, and a lot of times we kind of avoid uh, those planted forages in, in places that it typically won't make. Uh, and in those situations, I often recommend people use a, a shallow disking approach. So take a disker, turn up the first two, three inches of soil, again, meandering strips. Uh, to create a little disturbance and encourage weedy growth when we do get some rainfall. Or drill it no-till and uh, yeah. not damage the turf. But, you know, on the converse of that, like some of that, you showed some Coleman County slides, and uh -huh. some of that property's got a, a really big portion of it, percentage of it is has been a historic small grain field. Uh, one thing to get more habitat in there would be to plant, some of the big bunch grasses and spots where you wouldn't be plowing or future planting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some people have gone even to, to putting in what they call prairie strips, you know, in, in the middle of those fields. So trying to do a strip of these native grasses and such across the field to increase connectivity, even if you've got planted forages.